Is there not an entire section on this subject? No, yes, but I may have changed my mind in the meantime on that, so it's unfair. I may have, I may have changed my mind about Mithra, for example. Is, is, your, is your book for sale about it? Yes, sir. What have you ever asked God for forgiveness? <laughs> I'm not sure I have. I just go and try and do a better job from there. I don't think so. Let me tell you, 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 let You'd think I would know what episode I was on and uh, have that in mind before I start. But, you know, who wants to uh, really be professional when we do something like this, right? Um, so, it is episode 22. I am your host, The Evangelical Norm. The abortion counter is up, so obviously we're going to talk a little bit about uh, some stuff that has to do with abortion today. Um this week has been, it's been a week. It has been uh, crazy stuff going, things that have been said, uh, stuff that has been done, uh, good and bad. So we'll just go ahead and we'll, we'll just jump right into it. Why not? Why, why uh, delay, you know, the beating of the dead horse or whatever it is that we're going to do today. Um, the official, now how did that get in there? Um <laughs> The official coroner's report for uh, Jeffrey Epstein's death is that uh, he committed suicide. Again, I'm not buying it. I am not a, a conspiracy theory guy, but um, I'm not buying the fact that uh, Epstein committed suicide. Now, I, as you know, to be funny and so on, I put the portrait of uh, Bill Clinton in the blue dress um, up here, which nobody should ever have to see again. I saw it once. I can't unsee it. It's, uh, yeah, Bill Clinton in a blue dress. Uh, no, By no means does this indicate that I think that Bill Clinton or Hillary is responsible for Epstein's death. Far too many people involved in this uh, situation to be able to pinpoint one person. It could have been multiple people colluding. <laughs> There's your collusion. Um, to make what happened to Epstein happen. Far too many uh, things had to happen accidentally for this guy to have killed himself. Uh, the two guards falling asleep. I don't buy it. The doctoring of the, the logbooks. Um, the, the broken bones in the neck, the, the manner in which he killed himself, supposedly, uh, all of this, it, it's just too, I mean, it, it's the perfect storm. It's, it's too convenient. Um, I don't buy it. I think he, if he did kill himself, he was encouraged to do so in some way, shape or form. And I do believe somebody got paid. To, uh, to fall asleep and allow this to happen. So, there you go. Um, I'll, I'll continue to talk about this as long as it can, needs to be talked about. I, I hope this doesn't mean they drop the investigation. There are people that were also involved in this that need to, um, that need to uh, have justice uh, delivered to them. Uh, for the girls that, and I don't know if there were boys involved. I think it was all girls, but you hear a lot about children, underage girls, and so on. I, at this point, I'm not going to be surprised by anything if they find out that there were boys involved in that too. But right now, all we know is girls were involved, but there were underage girls who were abused, who were um, victimized by a lot of people. And I think a lot of these people need to face justice for what they've done. And so I hope that they continue to investigate. They continue to, 
to go through the documents and so on that Jeffrey Epstein had to make sure that justice is done uh, for somebody. And at this point, Jeffrey Epstein is not going to face uh, the judgment of the, the government, but he is face to face before his maker and he will face that justice and God being the perfect judge will uh, act accordingly and we'll find out when when we pass we'll find out what happened to Jeffrey Epstein so again I can't say for sure that he went to hell absolutely I never saw any uh, indication that he repented or put his faith in Christ with that being said likelihood of going to hell is there but last minute conversions can happen and so we just don't know uh, as far as from a Christian worldview, we don't know what is up. I'm not going to condemn Epstein. Um, I would love to have seen him meet the justice system and have civil justice uh, meted out by the by the civil magistrate. But at this point, he's going to receive the eternal justice. So we'll see. Again, we'll see what happens when we pass on, get to the other side, and find out. Not that any of us are going to be interested or even care about Epstein once we get to heaven. So that uh, being that's done, uh, Planned Parenthood. Uh, this is why our abortion counter is up there. So uh, apparently this week the Trump administration changed some rules um, in the Title Ten. Uh, is it Title Ten or Title Nine? Title Ten. Um, funding for nonprofits and so on and so Planned Parenthood one of the the rules is that anybody receiving title 10 funding cannot uh, consult or uh, recommend I guess abortion so Planned Parenthood is now losing their title 10 funding here's my question here's what I was curious about when I first heard this because again we've talked about and we've seen defunding and stuff like that and it's never more than like about 10% of what they get apparently they're gonna lose about 60 million dollars um, from title 10 uh, restrictions which means it's maybe 11 12 13 percent of their funding excuse me of their funding they're going to lose uh, because of this. But here's the question. Planned Parenthood is so adamant about talking about that only 3% of what they do is abortion. Well, if only 3% of what you do is abortion, why would you give up that Title X funding? Why would you just not stop doing that 3% and continue on with the 97% of stuff that you do that would continue to give you Title X funding? It's because abortion is a lot more than 3% of what they do. And it is an integral part of what they do. It is the core of what Planned Parenthood is. And so you can see just by this action that they do not meet up with the um, words that they say. That their actions and their words don't coincide when it comes to percentage of of uh, services rendered versus monies brought in and so abortion is a huge thing and so that's why they're not going to let it go here's the other thing that i want to talk about not specifically about planned parenthood but it was i saw it on steve day's show this week that um the national right to life group was <laughs> testifying against a heartbeat bill, an abortion ban bill in Tennessee uh, by stating things like we didn't have enough votes to overturn Roe v. Wade and so before, instead of saving babies now and getting this law passed through that we needed to vote Trump again and get more uh, pro-life judges on the court which again by what Trump has done in the past between Gorsuch and Kavanaugh I don't believe either one of those men is pro-life enough to overturn Roe, and I don't think we're going to get an actual pro-life judge out of Trump. I don't think Trump knows what a pro-life judge looks like. And so I'm not, I'm not confident in the fact that Trump is going to give us a, any pro-life judges. But 
here's the thing. This is a national right to life organization. And they're literally voting against, they're testifying against a bill that will save the lives of children. This is why we cannot trust this group, the National Right to Life, and many of the Right to Life groups uh, throughout the states that are out there. We can't trust them because they're not truly, uh, they're more of a political movement and not really a uh, grassroots uh, save the children movement like end abortion now is or apology yeah, well apology and end abortion now are connected um but i hate to say abolish human abortion because they're but they are they're uh they're very pro-life they they want to save babies there's just an issue with the way that they interact with other churches that don't necessarily coincide with what they think about abortion i've said it many times and i'll say it again your thing doesn't have to be everybody's thing we all should, as every Christian, should be pro-life and think abortion is abhorrent and should stop. But it doesn't mean that every Christian needs to be out and at an abortion clinic preaching the gospel. As many of them as we can get out there, we should. But for some people, that's just not how they're wired. That's not how, how they're created, and it's not what God gave for them. And those people could be just prayer support, financial support, whatever— but it doesn't necessarily mean everybody require every Christian is required to go out and preach against abortion. They should have the uh, mindset and the worldview that abortion is murder and it is wrong because it violates God's law. It, it is a violation against uh, an imago day human being created in the image of God. So we need to we need to stop. Uh, as Christians, we truly need to stop relying on the government to defund and uh, pass these laws and so on. We need to be out, and it sounds like I'm contradicting myself, but we need groups from every church. There are people in every church who are wired to go out and do street evangelism and moreover to do abortion ministry evangelism. Here is the way that this is done. We, we are bold. We call abortion what it is. We call it murder. We, we call out to people to, to beg them to save their babies. Um, offering, having people who are lined up, who are ready and willing to adopt. But we preach the gospel. If you watch uh, End Abortion Now videos, Apology at Church, um, just this last week, you, if Dusty Marshall was out and they had videos of him. Phenomenal presentations of the gospel of forgiveness even if these people are coming out of the clinic after they've done the the horrendous act of murdering their child there is still salvation available in jesus christ there's still forgiveness available in jesus christ this is not the unpardonable unpardonable sin uh murder can be forgiven we see it from paul and and other places where uh murderers are forgiven and saved um and so we know that uh, the aborted mother can repent. Ab aborted fathers. I'm a, I'm a prime example. I'm a post-abortive dad. I have a child in heaven because I wrote a check 20-some years ago. <laughs> Don't make me do math. 1992. So 27 years ago. Uh, March time frame. So 27 and a half or so. I wrote a check and sent it to a girl that I had gotten pregnant uh, for her to take to pay a man in a clinic to murder our child. And I received forgiveness from Christ. I was able to repent of my sin and put my faith in Jesus and he forgave me my sin. He is faithful to forgive us of our sin and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So those are the things we need to be doing. We need to con qu quit relying on government and political organizations to put an end to abortion, and we need to be out there. I firmly believe the answer to abortion is uh, Christians witnessing to women and men who are going to have their children murdered. Now, again, I don't. that doesn't mean... Don't get involved in, in politics. Don't get involved in these things. Vote. 
be there, you know, demand that Trump give uh, us the, the pro-life judges that he promised that I don't think he has delivered on. Uh, vote for these these laws. And, and some people would say pragmatism, incrementalism, it's no good, we shouldn't vote for those. I, I and personally, I think incrementalism is okay. The more laws that are changed, even if it only saves 2% of babies, that's 2% that are not murdered. And that is, I'm behind that. I, I, I want them to go all the way and just abolish it across the board. But I am willing to put my vote behind anything that will save more and more babies. And I know that there are going to be people that I admire and people that I, I respect and trust that are going to disagree with me on that. But that's an area where we have to agree to disagree. I'm not going to completely vote against any bill that will save the life of a, ch a child because it doesn't go far enough. Every little step uh, gets us closer to saving babies across the board, and we need to do that. So there's Planned Parenthood. And then the probably the craziest thing of the week, uh, there were... Uh, Allusions to uh, statements made comparing uh, Donald Trump to me messianic statements made regarding Donald Trump. We'll say it that way. Uh, Wayne Allen Root, who is a, a quote unquote conservative um, talk show host, because I say that because I don't think many conservatives are really conservative anymore. They're um, they're just political prostitutes essentially on one side or another um, and I don't I truly don't think that the the conservative bent, bent is in there in most of them so again I say that not really knowing Wayne Allen Root but this statement alone what was said by Wayne Allen Root about Donald Trump that that they think he they considered to be the king of the Jews and the the second coming of God uh, whether even if those are merely uh, analogies, whatever they were intended to be, that's blasphemy. Donald Trump is not a messianic figure. He's nowhere close to even even possibly being a messianic figure. Uh, he's a adult, um, a buffoon. Uh, a, I won't call him a moron because I obviously he's he's an intelligent man, but he's a clown. He someone needs to take his Twitter away. Bottom line, some of the things he tweets, the name calling, all that stuff. It, I literally am ashamed that this man is the, the president of my country because he acts like he's seven going on seventy. Uh, but. And then he, after that, he doubled down and said, I am the chosen one. And I'm the only one who can do this, you know, the, that whole spiel. Well, there's only one chosen one, and that was Jesus Christ. Uh, he wasn't on the ballot. We got Trump. But what that leads to is to, to talk a little bit about the sovereignty of God. What does that mean? Obviously, God being sovereign, if we are going to believe that God is a sovereign deity and he is, he's in control of everything, then yes, we have to come to the conclusion that God chose to have Donald Trump put in office. There are times that I think that he was put in office there as a judgment on America and not a blessing. Because I don't think he is. As we look at the things that are happening right now, there's no blessing of this. Well, there is a little bit of financial uh, boon and and so on where we've been uplifted a little bit. But it looks like uh, recession is right on the uh, uh, right around the corner. So I mean, there's been some financial, and he's had he has a couple of good policies. I mean. Great, if we're going to take away any kind of funding for Planned Parenthood, I'm good with that. But I would like to see more and more. I would like to see them completely defunded and not receive any government monies. So I've always tried to be just like Ben Shapiro. When Trump does something good, I will give him 
I'll, I will laud him and uh, give him props for what he does. And when he does something bad, I am going to call him on it. And this is something that the man needs to be called on. He is not the chosen one in that sense. But yes, God put him there. I think partially is a judgment on our country in the fact that the church has fallen away. As many evangelicals that got behind this guy after videotapes came out uh, where he talked about grabbing women by their genitals and, and the things that were said. And this guy is a, a serial adulterer. And, you know, we would, if this were a Democrat who had these these issues behind him i mean look at the way we went as uh evangelicals we went after bill clinton i mean he was we tore him up one side and down the other and the fact that those same people are willing to give donald trump a pass on the same issues is ridiculous we have to be consistent and so because evangelicals began to look away from the standards and going well you know but he he says it says it like it is most of conservative and liberal politics have become just how much we can piss off the person on the other side you know I, if i see i mean if i had a dollar for every meme i saw that was you know owning the libs i mean if i'd have a lot of money I probably wouldn't have had to refinance my house to, to finish my basement. But, I mean, it's ridiculous that so many people will do anything just to tick off the libs or just to tick off the conservatives. You know, that's why we see conflicts like the Proud Boys and Antifa. These are the extremes of both sides coming together where all they want to do is tick off the other person and they all they want to do is fight. And we, I mean, I'm old enough to remember times in our country when there was, there was cooperation on both sides of the aisle. And now it's just, just contempt and ugliness. I saw a tweet tonight of somebody asking, you know, that was probably in their 30s or something, have, have we always been like this? And somebody going, no, I remember back in the day when there was civil discourse going on. And, you know, we disagreed fundamentally on a lot of things, but it wasn't as ugly as it is now. And it wasn't as extreme. Uh, you know, even, I mean, 30 years ago, no, not even the Democrats would have um, dreamt about electing uh, anti-Semite like Ilhan Omar uh, to be a member of Congress. I mean, that would never have happened. Her her past would have come out and it would have shut it down. And people, you know, obviously don't care anymore. You know, you check enough boxes, that intersectionality thing, and, and you can pretty much do whatever you want. But bottom line is, um, I think I rabbit trailed a little bit from what I did want to talk about. God's sovereignty. God did pick Donald Trump, but not in the manner that he is proclaiming. And even though, I mean, I was chosen by God to be saved. God determined that I would be here doing this podcast right now. God determined my 67 subscribers on YouTube. God determined my... 700 or so followers on Twitter. God determined all of that and he put me in a place but it, and he chose me to be in that spot. God chose me to to work at the job that I have. God, God chose me to serve as an elder in my church. God absolutely chose me to be saved and to be given the gift of, of faith and repentance and uh, the ability to be called his child. God adopted me. He chose me. But it doesn't mean I can call myself the chosen one. Because there was only one of those. There's only one. You know, anytime you get to the point where you, uh, you're you a politician or anybody else saying, well, I'm the only one who can do this. Or someone saying, he's the only one that can do this. You have created for yourself an idol and it's time to shatter it. Because we can't put our faith in Trump. Our faith needs to be in God. And we need to be praying for these things and we need to be working to whether it is inside the, the political sphere or donating or 
anything we can do to shut down Planned Parenthood, to elect real conservatives, um, and to hold them to their promises. And to not, yeah, one of the other things that, that Trump did that really irritated me, and I mean, I don't, I wish nobody voted Democrat, but to, to make a statement like anybody who is Jewish or, or so on who votes Democrat is disloyal to Israel, I mean, again, th these are the stupid things that this guy tweets that make me embarrassed for my nation that this is the man who leads our country. Um, you know, again, I would never vote for somebody just because they piss off the left, but that's what got this guy elected. He was pissing off the libs, so so many conservatives and evangelicals who I, I just literally have to say they are not real solid in their theological foundation. I won't say that they're not saved, but I think they need to get a little bit deeper um, and a little bit of a more of a theological standard. Because to, to put your weight behind this guy was ridiculous to see as many evangelicals who did it. And so I was horrified. I'm embarrassed. This guy is, he's not the chosen one. He's definitely not any kind of messianic figure. He is, he's a clown. He's a clown who needs to be saved. I, I, the clip in the, in the beginning montage of the, of this show this is a guy who has never, who, in his own words, said he's never asked God for forgiveness. So he can't be saved. He can't be forgiven. He can't be a Christian until he does that. And how do we do that? We preach the gospel. We go out and we share the truth with people. And we pray that someday someone's going to be in this guy's path that they can either get a good tract in his hand that he'll read or that they can actually have a conversation with him and lead him down the path scripturally towards the knowledge of his own sin and his need for a savior. And then allow the Holy Spirit to bring conviction of sin, to bring regeneration to his heart, to grant him the gift of repentance so he can put his faith and trust in Jesus Christ. And God wants to use you and I, Christian, to do that. So again, I am always encouraging people to, to share the gospel. You don't have to be an evangelist to share the gospel, but everybody needs to do that work. Everybody needs to do the work of an evangelist. Everybody needs to be willing to share their faith. I mean, statistics are horrifying of how many people actually do. I mean, I heard 4% of men have never shared their faith with anybody else. You know, and I mean, that's a really old statistic from Promise Keepers, but it's a horrifying thought. That there are only 4% of Christian men in the church today have shared their faith with somebody who needs to hear it. Somebody who is destined for hell and we're not willing to step out of our comfort zone and share that faith. That's something we really need to think about. Again, I don't expect everybody to get up on a, on a, a pedestal and street preach or any of those things. But, I mean, anybody can go down and hand out tracts. Go to YouTube and look up... Uh, Ray Comfort, the man on George Street, and listen to what this guy did. Um, simple, handing out gospel tracts, asking a simple question, and moving on along their day. We can do that. But in order to do that, we have to stick with what I say every single week. And it is this, and it is true. Always preach the gospel. Use words. They're necessary. Until next week, Soli Deo Gloria. Mm -hmm.